so cool. Good. Yar. Hey there, fellow creators. Ben here from Cinderblock Studios, and I am here live today broadcasting from Redfish Full Studios here in Lawrenceville, PA. A special event. Uh, wanted to do a sort of a live workshop a number of uh, months ago, but COVID-19 hit. Kind of put a whole damper on that whole uh, pr process, so I figured, hey, let's just do a live uh, stream version, a uh, uh, virtual one, so to speak. Uh, so, if you guys have seen my videos before, a lot of this is going to be review, but I wanted a chance to do this uh, both live uh, here in Red Fishbowl Studios as well as a chance to uh, just maybe get some uh, additional viewership out there uh, showing out some of my uh, more unusual painting techniques, things that are a little bit less standard. Uh, forgive me if I kind of quit talking a few times here and there. I got to readjust my mask. I am in a public setting, so kind of important to uh, be working on that as I go. Also might end up bumping the mic here and there. Mm. So, it's going to be, uh, yeah, probably about oh, going through a couple of these. Can't imagine this takes going to be any more than about an hour and a half, but you know, is what it is. Uh, one thing I do want to apologize for right out of the gate is that my uh, tripod and camera are sitting on a table that is a little bit wobbly. So uh, again, that's gonna might be a little bit of an issue for you, but uh, hopefully not. Um, so I've essentially recreated my home setup uh, on a smaller scale. So I've got a couple of projects sitting there. I've got some tubes of paint off to the side. We're going to be playing with acrylics, watercolors, and inks tonight or today. <laughs> Trying to think, remember what time of the uh, the day it is. So should be uh, really fun regardless. So uh, to get things started, we're actually going to be doing uh, two different demos uh, for uh, a, a mixture of acrylics and, surprisingly, some uh, isopropyl, isopropyl rubbing alcohol. Now, this stuff's generally relatively easy to find, but of course we're in the midst of a pandemic right now, the course of the time of broadcasting, so if you can't find any of this stuff, that's okay. Come back to this video when you get a hold of some. But uh, I usually try and keep some in the studio, not to clean things with, but actually to do certain uh, techniques with as well. Hey, she spins in the chat. Welcome, welcome. I'm a little bit outside of my normal studio today, working uh, at my down at my local gallery for this live virtual demo. So welcome. So, uh, start things off, I just have some acrylics already laid out onto my palette, as well as a piece of primed, uh, this is a piece of poplar wood I picked up at the hardware store, which I cut down into a small 5x5, five five, or 5.5x5.5 five by five and a half inch square. Man, this is really awkward to do with a mask on. <laughs> More so than I thought it would be. Uh, on my palette here today, to start things out, I've got some cadmium yellow medium, some... Uh, what is this stuff? Sap green hue, as well as some Prussian blue hue, just to kind of get myself started. Now, this first technique is actually uh, something I don't necessarily do a ton anymore, but it's something I kind of uh, developed through learning about different acrylic properties and, and learning how to uh, work with them in different ways, which is why, you know, like I said, the uh, isopropyl is sort of part of that. So, in doing this, uh, you want to start like, with a relatively smooth surface. Now if you're trying to do this with a, uh, a piece of uh, heavier, rougher canvas, it probably won't work quite as well, but it should work, you know, fairly well. Anyway, um, so I'm wetting my brush, just kind of get things started and mix up some paint here. So I'm going to go with sort of a green and yellow gradient. I actually put this green on my palette a little too soon. And I'm going to thin my paint just enough so that so it flows but not so it's overly thin. It should be kind of coming down from a, a heavy body to closer to a soft body in terms of uh, mixed viscosity. I'm actually going to go ahead and flip this this way. I had a something else I was painting on top of this, and I was like, oh, wait, no, I have to. this had to be white to start. So I'm just going to lay that down and cover that about like that. It's okay that the paint's a little transparent, and you'll see why in just a bit. Okay. 
staying relatively thin here again. Again, I apologize about the little shakes in the camera. It's just some uh, little folding table. It's just, didn't really think about that when I got my setup going today. Okay. A little more yellow in there. Should get a nice soft ish gradient going between them. Now, there's a lot of things you can do with uh, with a nice soft uh, acrylic gradient like this. Uh, nothing uh, monumental, I would say. Uh, a, lot, a lot of times you don't, you know, let it dry, layer on top of it, blend it while it's still wet. But one of the interesting things you can do, uh, as I mentioned, is grab some isopropyl alcohol. Now, what isopropyl alcohol does to acrylics in particular is it creates a resist technique. You can actually remove both wet and dried paint really, 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 really easily just by either sprinkling, rubbing, or... Um, dousing a, a surface, an acrylic surface in it. Uh, if you're really desperate to get a piece of acrylic paint out of your clothes, you can also use it for that. Wow, it's crazy how little barrier in, in your, I'm actually going to pull this down, there's no way around me, I can do that <laughs> for the time being. So, um, when I do this, so what, what I'm essentially doing here is I'm going to do the same thing that uh, you might do with watercolors. A lot of times you put watercolors down, you sprinkle on water or uh, something like uh, like a water and oxcall mix, or you could use uh, uh, salt, does a similar thing, but you can't really necessarily just sprinkle water on this and get the same effect. So I'm going to just pour a little bit of this into the palm of my hand here, and then just kind of roll it forward and shake it onto that surface. And what you'll see almost immediately as all of those drips will start to kind of create a little bit of a resist technique. It'll be a little bit more pronounced if your paint was thinner. Uh, I kind of kept things a little thicker. I'm going to put a little more on there, in that corner there. We're just going to go ahead and let that sit, because it'll need a little bit of time to work its magic. And now, I'm not a scientist. I have no idea exactly the chemical, uh, or rather the physical reaction going on here. Uh, best I can guess here, though, is that uh, the rubbing alcohol is working its way down into the paint, and in some ways separating uh, the, the pigment and the, and the binder uh, to some degree, which is why you're able to clean paint out of a brush with it, out of your clothes, as well as do sort of these interesting little uh, resist uh, techniques with it. And that's sort of one step, and that's, in this case, a very much an additive way of using the acrylics and the alcohol. But uh, over the course of the past year, I've actually been working on developing uh, a technique that does this, but does it in a slightly different way. So what I'm going to need for this is a different piece that I had prepped. Hopefully this will work because uh, I didn't necessarily <laughs> plan this accordingly, even though I should have. Um, and so this particular uh, square, I started with uh, oils. And it works generally well with oils because oils resist uh, rubbing alcohol while acrylics do not. So the whole base of this, this gradient of color, I started with some RNF pigment sticks. Now I had to do this in advance, otherwise it would have never dried in time. Uh, but these are really cool, so I brought one to uh, at least show you guys um, kind of the stuff and what it does. Um, so the RNF sticks, they're essentially oil paint in a stick. Uh, it's kind of like a big crayon, but it's, it's just uh, oil paint and uh, uh, beeswax to kind of give it a little more of a stick structure, and then you can kind of start working it out onto your uh, canvas, substrate, cardboard, whatever, you know, what have you. Uh, so I did that with with an Elizabeth Crimson, uh, this particular uh, Ked uh, Yellow Deep, as well as I think it was a, if I'm remembering right, a Santa Yellow Extra Pale was, was the whiter color here. Laid those on, kind of blended it down with my finger, let it sit for a couple of days. Now this morning, unfortunately, it was not as dry as I wanted it to be. Uh, so in order to rectify that, what I did is uh, 
then apply just a simple clear coat on top of that in order to try to be sure that that's solidified down, but unfortunately it did kind of rub a little bit in transport, so I'm hoping this works. If not, I've got a dried sample off to the side. Uh, we, we can work with that. Now with this one, I am uh, grabbing some uh, Golden High Flow Carbon Black. Um, now you can do this with any color, really, but I'm finding that I find that the black works the best in order to push that contrast a bit more, especially for what we're going to be uh, doing with it come uh, when we grab the alcohol. It's a nice low viscosity acrylic with a really nice uh, level of pigment uh, and uh, tint strength and all that fun stuff. Uh, so I'm like create something of a of a landscape in here. I'm trying to think what I want to actually do here. I probably should have thought about it beforehand, but okay. This is exactly what I was afraid of. The viscosity's too thin. Because I haven't done this in a while and I forgot what the hell I was doing with it. So you actually need a thicker viscosity paint if this is gonna work because our surface is really smooth, otherwise it's just gonna resist. And you're not going to be able to get what you need out of it. So in this case, I'm actually going to go ahead and add some Prussian blue to my palette. And work on getting a nice thick layer of paint. Because I forgot how to do this. Uh, that's what I needed. Okay. I'm just going to go ahead and lay that down. Create something of a silhouette in terms of our shapes. Maybe create like a river or something in there. Work our way down. Still getting more resist here than I was hoping for. But that's what I get when I test something in advance. <laughs> okay. Alrighty. Now this obviously will need some time to dry, but the good news is we've got other projects to work on while that's drying. So, how's, a, how's this thing looking? Pretty good. It's still a little wet on the edges. But actually, this I may end up doing a little bit of a lift with. So, here's a paper towel that's mostly dry. So, uh, this stuff, I could just let this sit and, and let it be wet and dry and, you know, what have you. But I want to actually remove some of this paint in order to give it uh, a bit more of an interesting effect. So, the way this is kind of sitting with the drips right now... And the way it's drying, it actually reminds me of uh, cellular structures, uh, which is pretty cool. So I'm going to go ahead and use that uh, and, and just, you know, amplify that and, and work with it that way. I'm just going to cover that with the, the paper towel, rub it to lift that paint off, and boom, that takes off any of that excess. I don't want to rub side to side because I don't want to rip any of this other paint off of here. But a little bit on those edges. Creates a rather interesting little technique there. Now from here, there's a lot of things that I could do. Uh, one thing that I'm thinking about is to grab a little white, actually. I probably should have brought some glazing liquid or some GAC 100 with me, but... I never seem to grab everything that I need. <laughs> but we can do the same thing just with some water that I kind of want to do with this. And I'm just going to thin that out, grab a little bit of that yellow-green from before, just slightly off-color the white. And then from here, I actually think I want to glaze a little bit with this to define the maybe inner parts of those cells. Don't need that much paint. If 
And I got to be careful at this point just because uh, I know this underlying paint isn't completely dry yet. So there's a chance I could rip that up if I'm not careful. That's not bad. Seems to be coming together there. Like so. Now when I get back home to my studio, I'll probably come in here with some zinc white and work with this a little bit more. This would actually give me a pretty good starter for a lot of different things that I could do with it. And with any kind of painting project, it's always nice to be able to flip your surface over. You can actually kind of see what you're doing. I'm going to kind of do a little bit more dry brushing on this one. And obviously a technique like this, whether you, again, it changes a little bit depending on how much paint you put down and, and the viscosity of the paint that you put down. Uh, so a significantly thinner paint is going to have a little different effect. It's going to have a little, that resist is going to be a lot more pronounced. Uh, while uh, something like this where I left the paint a little bit on the thicker side, the, the resist is a little bit more minimal. As always, anyone, any of you guys watching on YouTube that uh, you know are logged in and have an account, you guys want to drop me a question, absolutely can uh, get to those along the way. I'm actually only going to find maybe a couple of these. I like the idea of keeping things relatively simple. <laughs> rather than just the one on the bottom. Okay. So that's, again, just a really simple thing you could do uh, with the resist, resist technique by uh, just splattering some uh, regular isopropyl 70% on top of some wet acrylic. It does a little bit of a resist technique very similar to what you might get out of a, uh, a watercolor paint. All right, I'm going to go ahead and check on this other guy. He is just starting to get a little bit tacky, so we'll have to give him a little more time. But while that's happening, we're going to go ahead and do the same thing, actually, with the other one that I had off to the side before I forget. So, same deal. This is a little bit different one. I have some underlying acrylic texture here, and I didn't put a clear coat over this oil, uh, this oil paint, so it's going to be a little bit different. I'm hoping I can actually work with a thinner paint for this one. Let's see. Nope, still got that nasty resist. All right. <laughs> it's the nature of oils. Just got to maintain that. Yeah, this probably won't work as well as I want it to. Got a lot of that underlying color there. a little better. Could really move this a little further up, shouldn't I? <laughs> All right.
headphones keep sliding. I'm not used to leaning over this much when I'm uh, when I'm working. My table at home is a lot is like at least eight inches higher than this. Actually, I'll leave that. Put that up there. All right, that's a decent start for that one. Got to move that back over. Okay. Now, since both of those are still drying, we're going to go ahead and jump to our next one, our next little project, and we're going to go back and forth a little bit. Now that's That'll be drying in about 15 minutes or so. So, all righty. This one's really, really simple and easy. So we're going to shift the gears a little bit and move into some watercolor before we kind of take it back to acrylics. So, oop, hello. Oh, wow, got that all over my, my cord right there. That's lovely. Not used to this portable setup. <laughs> Just drag, drag my headphone cord all through that paint. That's fantastic. All right. So, I'm going to drink here. All right, so this is going to be one we'll get to in just a minute because this is uh, the first little tip for this uh, for today, at least from the watercolor side of things, which I now remembering how to switch my water for. So a lot of times when you are working with watercolor, your paper kind of curls up like this. It's just something that happens with it. But there's a really easy way to fix this. You just flip it upside down. Uh, I need to find my watercolor brush. <laughs> And you paint the other side with some water, as you might with uh, a front. So this, you think, oh, well, just it'll then it'll curl up the other way. Yes, but it'll probably curl up the other way a little too much. And that's something that you want to try to avoid at all costs. So how do you avoid that at all costs? Well, pretty simple. Just put something heavy on top of it. That's not heavy enough, is it? These are, though. Heavy and flat, preferably, but that should work just the same. Now, while that's drying, which shouldn't take super long, we're going to actually do a, another separate one here to uh, demo the technique a little bit further when we get to that one. So with any kind of uh, simple watercolor piece, uh, it's really important to tape down your edges to whatever you're working on. Now, unfortunately, my cardboard surface isn't taped to the table, so I might get a little bit more warping than I originally or otherwise would. Uh, but it's important to note to tape down your edges if you're going to be doing a uh, watercolor piece uh, just on a piece of loose paper. If you're working in a pad, you have a little bit more freedom, especially uh, those pads with the glued, ed with the glued edges um, tend to be uh, a little more forgiving. Simple 140-pound paper like this, though, you want to make sure you prep that in advance. just joining in, welcome to the uh, virtual uh, live demo and slash workshop. Uh, I'm broadcasting today not from my home studio, even though it might look that look like that based on how I've got things set up, but uh, I'm down in Lawrenceville, neighborhood of Pittsburgh, at my uh, local gallery, the Red Fishbowl Studios. Uh, broadcasting from here because it's a little bit, uh, gets me out of my element and makes for a little bit more of an interesting uh, stream, I feel. Now, at the end of all these demos, I will do what I can to actually uh, lift the camera up and take you guys around, but that's going to be a little more cumbersome without uh, ripping cords out of the wall, so we're going to hold off on that. Okay, so my watercolors, I just brought in a little uh, half pan here, a little set of four different colors. This was a, uh, I think, centelier red, my yellow, I don't even know what I used for the yellow. It was either a cad yellow deep, 
which I don't, doesn't look like it is. I think it might be uh, the benzamidazolone yellow. Uh, this I think is that the green one. Yeah, I think that's. I think this is actually a hooker's green gouache, and the red, the other red, is a uh, Venetian red, if I recall. I don't know. I squeezed these. I squeezed these out of the tube the other day. I don't really remember. Now, when I'm working with watercolors, um, I'm using them a little bit differently than most people use them. Although I just now remember I have to reactivate all these. <sighs> so we get some water on each of the, each of them, so they start uh, coming back to life. Um, I tend to use them a little bit more, just like big, heavy washes, um, rather than uh, the more subtle colors that a lot of uh, professional watercolors do. Um, so you'll see me use a bit more color than a lot of uh, other painters would. I tend to I tend to not mix with them uh, a whole heck of a lot. So I'm just gonna get some of this down and start spreading it around here. In different spots, not all at one. Not it's not simple. Not necessarily a simple gradient. Not necessarily go into one corner with it. All right. Get some red. I think there was something else on that brush besides red, and and yellow. Must have been in the in the little well. Wow, that's a lot darker than I wanted it to be. Oh well, we'll work with it. Yeah, there was something else in that pan that just totally got sucked into that red. Blue or something. Should have should have wiped that pan out before I put color into it. Some different brush strokes. Go back and forth. Back to that yellow for a minute. Yeah, this is a lot messier than I was hoping it was going to be. I got really muddy with this really fast. I'll get some of that Venetian red and rectify some of this. <laughs> Also, my paper might be upside down. I didn't even check for that. I think, yeah, hold on. Yeah, I think my paper's upside down. That would make a difference, wouldn't it? <laughs> totally don't have the absorbency on this side at all. Oh, jeez. Keep... keep screwing up by dripping up here. Yeah, normally, I'm using the, the, the color pretty much straight out of the tube, not doing a ton of dilution. So, I don't have my... My bearings aren't as tight as they would be with some of this color. This might be a little bit lighter than the other one, but that's all right. Get a bunch more yellow. Ish. God, that's a nice mess right there. <laughs> yeah, totally not what I was, totally not what I was going for, but that's all right. We can work with that. We're going to let that kind of bleed down a little bit. I'll shake a little extra water in there just for some uh, additional effects. Okay, now with this, I'm just going to wipe, my, wipe this edge, pull all that excess water out of there. That's pretty decent. Not great, but decent. <laughs> All right. This whole mask, glasses, headset setup is not faring as well as I was hoping. Mm. All right. Sorry, constantly having to readjust today. Now, this side's dry and flat again. Well, not dry underneath our things there, but now this one, 
has flattened out and this one's ready to work with. Again, I'm sorry about the sh shakes of the camera, not something I can really help today. All right, let me get this tape off. It's always the single most satisfying part about working with watercolors, pulling that tape. I'm doing this while it's wet, uh, just out of speed and laziness. Uh, with most paints, you want to do do this when it's wet, but with watercolors, you usually want to do it when it's dry, because you actually have a higher chance of ripping the paper doing this when it's wet. But I'm lazy. And this is just a demo, so I don't care as much. <laughs> if it turns out good, yay, it'll turn out good, but okay. Come on, thumbnail, get in there. <laughs> yeah, rip that corner a little bit. That's all right. Yep. Yeah, there's there's a rip. That's what I'm trying to avoid. That's why you don't do it when it's wet. Yeah, and that corner ripped a little bit too, but that's okay. It's just a corner. That, that'll disappear under a mat. Okay, so much like our uh, acrylic demos, uh, we have to let this one dry, so we're just going to set this off to the side, and we're going to work on this one to start. So now this particular one is one that I did straight out of the tube color, uh, very little dilution with water, and uh, obviously didn't have to reactivate the paint as I was going. So the color is much more vibrant. Now I do a lot of these little watercolor mixed media pieces, and they're super, super fun to do, but uh, they can kind of look a little bit daunting sometimes because you just see like a gradient of color and you see all kind of weird, unusual ink stuff right on top of it. Uh, but what's interesting about this is this is actually a technique that I picked up from a, uh, I believe, French artist by the name of Stéphane Bouchard. Uh, now, Bouchard's work, he did a uh, series back, jeez, uh, 10 years ago called The Daily Monster. And what he did is he took a blob of ink and then basically made a monster around it. But what's interesting is he put a blob of ink and somehow would get the ink to spray out. Uh, I was like, are you sitting there and going, and just blowing on it? I, I don't know. Luckily, when you ask an artist questions, a lot of times they're really excited to get back to you on uh, those questions. and Excited to tell you how they did something most of the time. I've run into a few artists that are like, no, no, I can't tell you. Trade secret. It's like, oh, bummer. Wanted to try that. But uh, in this case, we've got an artist that was more than happy to share uh, what he was doing with me. So I'm actually going to figure out which way I want to turn this. I actually kind of like that way, I think, for at least what I'm thinking. Uh, so now this is a little bit messy, and I have a other piece of cardboard here, which hopefully I can... Uh, that'll block the camera, won't it? Yeah, I think it will. I guess i got to be careful then. <laughs> I'm pretty far enough away from most things. Actually, if I just move my sketchbook, I'll be... Yeah, I'm just about to move my sketchbook so this doesn't go anywhere that it's not supposed to. Um, in a fairly open studio space right now, so I'm not worried about spraying anything in here. But, uh, yeah. So, uh, for this, you'll need either a low-viscosity paint, or my personal preference for this is what uh, Bouchard used for his... Uh, Daily Monster stuff, and that is some Black India ink. Uh, now, if, again, if you've seen my videos before, if this is just going to be a review. You've, you've probably seen me do this uh, in varying demos from time to time. But for anyone watching who's a fan through Red Fishbowl, uh, welcome to the uh, live uh, the live workshop, and this is just uh, something new for you. So, uh, with this, I start by kind of mentally thinking about exactly where I want stuff. Um, and that's really important for any type of, type of art. Uh, even pieces like this that are kind of more freeform, let's say. <laughs> uh, these, are, these are techniques that uh, still require a little bit of thought. Because if you're just putting, putting stuff wherever, things aren't necessarily going to look good. So, standard uh, black India ink. And since I'm a landscapey person, we're going to do something landscapey but I will get into some of the options you can do with this uh, on the next piece. So, laying down a decent amount of ink here, treating that sort of like a horizon line. Now, what do you do to get the spray? You could use a straw, 
but uh, what was recommended to me was a can of compressed air, also known as electronic duster. I think it actually has some big long chemical name too, but uh, we're not uh, worrying about that today. Uh, so bringing that down, I'm going to put my finger here, it's going to get covered in ink, but don't worry about it, and we're just spraying that ink. Don't blink. <laughs> What's interesting is you get all these unique little branchy elements out of that. Yeah, my can, my can of air is almost out. And just like that, yeah, there's there's all that all over my hand now. You get that uh, that little bit of a mess. Now I use my watercolor brush for this. I pull any r remnant ink down. Uh, from the middle of that to cover the rest of this to give myself some baseland. Pull that in. And just like that, we've got ourselves a little mixed media landscape. Now, one thing I'll do with this is I'll add a little extra ink, throw it into this cap, because why the hell not? thin it out, and I want to get a couple of just abstracty drips in here. Just tapping that brush on the end uh, on my finger to get all those little splatters. Kind of want to be careful with that. It's really easy to go overboard. And you can go overboard with this, and it's fine. It looks, as long as you're doing doing it intentionally. With any piece or any anything like this, if you're not doing anything intentionally, it's just going to look like a mess. Uh, so intention is, is very, very key. I would say it's very key for a lot of kinds of art, but... I'm going to pull some of the excess water off of this. You know, despite all the muddiness of this, I really like the color coming out of this. And I've got a really cool idea for it in, uh, in a little bit. Might it be vertical? Yeah, I'm probably going to leave it that way, the way that I did it. Okay. Now, as a, as before, I need to let this dry. But before we do, I do want to talk about what I can do with this and what you can do with this. Now, of course, with any of the drips, I could, of course, take that spray again and just hit it. Uh, and t but all of those end up kind of looking weird when they're just drop, like a drop, and then there's a tail coming out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, doesn't look like much, but uh, totally doable depending on what you're doing with this. I always thought this would be a really interesting thing to do with a portrait. So you have like an outline of a figure, and then you do this to the edge uh, in varying capacities really really cool uh thing to do that way uh whether that be a hairline or just an arm some way to give a little extra expression to a figure now i'm not a figure artist uh so i don't do stuff like that but uh it's totally something that could be done and that's one of the reasons why i thought it'd be well worth sharing okay so this guy's coming off to the side this thing's still wet i think yes yeah, so i got that corner gotta give that at least another 10 minutes before i touch any more of that but I'm pretty sure this is dry now. Yep, it's a little tacky, but that's actually, that's actually perfectly fine. So, shifting gears back to our acrylic side as I go for a drink. I don't know what the hell's going on with my headset today. Probably because I don't, probably because I don't have any hair, so my headset doesn't like staying on. <laughs> Every time I'm moving and jumping around, it slides all over the place. Okay, so to review what we had done prior to this particular project is dripped some uh, rubbing isopropyl alcohol down onto uh, a wet surface to create a resist technique. Now this is one way to do this. You can use that, and that is a very interesting sort of additive technique. However, you can use the same technique as a subtractive technique. Uh, now, I'm not saying that I've invented, a tr invented subtractive techniques. By no means have I. Uh, that would be really uh, short-sighted and rude of me to think that in, in, in any capacity to think that I did do that. But this is a technique I've been working with off and on over the past little over a year, I think it is. Uh, and it's not perfect yet, but it is something that is really cool. So again, the base of this was uh, oil, 
with a clear coat on top of that, and on top of that was a thick, preferably thick, uh, acrylic paint for that those uh, dark sections. Now from here, you can take a brush, a Q-tip, your finger, or whatever you want to use, really, and a little bit of that alcohol, and now removing some of that paint in selective areas. So let's say my light source is roughly in the center here. And you can use that to pull that paint up. And because we're still a little, ooh, hello, still a little tacky, uh, the paint's going to kind of re-wet. I'm going to use a paper towel here to kind of pull that up and over. Now if the acrylics were completely dry, you'd probably have to use a stiffer, stiffer bristle brush for this. But because we're working with a paint that's sort of just tacky, tacky dry, not totally not totally dry, you actually have a little bit more freedom to kind of re-wet that paint and keep working with it. Now if this was strictly acrylic on acrylic, what you would end up doing by you know, pulling your, your brush around like this is, end, is uh, just ripping all of that paint off, which is why I do the base coat in oil and then come in with uh, acrylic and then the subtractive acrylic on top of that. And I love doing these with a lot more different colors. I mean, this was just a simple uh, red, red, orange uh, gradient. But it's really, really fun to work with this. And I'm actually going to grab a knife and even pull some of that. Yeah. Now we can get sort of like this subtractive cross hatching thing going on here. Using the knife to pull some of that up since we loosened all that extra paint. that a little bit. Nope, that's the ink. <laughs> Losing track of my palettes here. Let's just loosen that up. And I'm going to scrape with the knife and just add that little extra bit of finagling. <laughs> finagling, finesse, you know, whatever you want to call it really. Kind of like that. And again, the more color you, you have, the more that underlying, in this case, like the reds and the oranges. I'm going to come up here for this one. Again, re, reworking that. Letting that sit for a second. And then, and since we're pulling that up, we're just, we're all we're doing here is just revealing the color underneath. And since that gradient was there, you get basically instant highlights with that same color without having to remix paint. And again, not, nothing, uh, nothing fancy here. This was just uh, oil, uh, oil, clear coat, acrylic paint, and some regular 70% isopropyl you can get at your local uh, grocery and or drugstore. Supposing, supposing you can find some during the pandemic, but uh, things have uh, balanced out from a few months ago, and I've been able to at least find some of it here and there. Yeah, I'm starting to rip that a little bit more. I need some more of the, I need some more of the isopropyl to push that around a bit. So yeah, acrylics might seem permanent, but there's a lot you can do with them if you really kind of start playing with just a couple extra things that maybe don't really feel like acrylic mediums. Uh, the rubbing alcohol in this case, but there's a lot more versatility, a lot more you can do with them than you might otherwise realize. And this is just a simple little, little technique to uh, take your work just a little bit further. All right. So we're going to move back to our other one here, I think. A little bit, a little bit wet up here still. So I think I might give that just a little extra time. But we will go back to our other one. The only thing that's wet in here right now is our ink drips. Now from here, there's a lot you can do. Uh, there's a lot of 
you know, options. Any kind of a mixed media piece is going to have uh, options of any variety. Uh, and in doing so, uh, it's really up to you. Uh, I've done everything from chalk pastel to uh, uh, oil pastel, colored pencil. Uh, but one thing I actually love doing that's a little bit more simple is just coming in with a uh, an ink pen. Either that be another black ink pen or one of these uh, Uniball Signo white pens. This is just one of my regular day-to-day -day sketch pens. So I'll come in here and maybe give it... Uh, I'll use the yellow as my light source. So just sketch a little bit with it. Creating some baseland and hopefully not gumming up my pen. We are still a little, bit, a little, little moist here. Also, these pens have a really weird flow in them. Maybe put my make my, my figures little white figures rather than little black figures, since uh, working with a different color, uh, white on black in this case. It's kind of they have a negative reverse effect, and then uh, simple signature. Uh, let's, let's see. It's November now. Neat. November of 20. Just like that. Uh, really simple, little, easy to go uh, mixed media technique. I love doing pieces like this. End up selling these uh, here at the gallery. Uh, usually for around you know, 20, 30 bucks, something like that. Uh, just something to, it's, an, it's something different from a print. You know, it's an original piece of artwork that, uh, just ends up being uh, more dynamic, more interesting. It has a little more free form. You can you can do more with it, uh, and you don't have to. Uh, it's, uh, it's kind of contradicting what I said earlier. You don't have to think about it. You, I mean, you have to think about your you know placement of objects and composition and things like that. But uh, I love these because they're mental. They're mental palette cleanser pieces for me because I don't have to put in the same work that I do uh, with my uh, bigger paintings. So. Really fun little simple technique to spray the ink uh, over top of a watercolor base. Uh, interestingly enough, though, you can do this with uh, regular acrylics too. Uh, if you had a you know piece like this, do you want to put something over top of this? You could come in with something like the uh, the high, black black high flow or whatever color high flow you really you want. Drop that onto a surface, spray it, uh, and if you're going acrylic on top of acrylic, it won't be as big of a deal. Spray that in, it'll stick, uh, works just the same. So just remember, thin paint or ink in a can of uh, compressed computer duster air uh, works really, really great for all kind of different things. Okay, so <laughs> go ahead and snag a swig of my, of my tea here. <laughs> All right, so we're taking a little bit of a shift here, and I want to talk about uh, color maps. Now, I've talked about, done, I think, quick tips about color maps before, but I want to do a small one here today, just because, to show you how uh, versatile and interesting of a, of a uh, no, sorry, versatile, but uh, useful of a, of a tool uh, a color map can be. Now, if you've got a lot of colors, and in my personal studio, I do. I have uh, my regular heavy body set, I think is something like 14 or 15 colors, and that's a lot. And it's really easy to kind of lose track of what colors mix uh, uh, into what other colors. Um, I mean, I mean, obviously, they all mix into the other colors, but what, what the end result is, it's easy to forget, and it's easy to forget about certain color mixes that you might not think about. Uh, so I want to do a little bit of a color map here today. So this is a simple... Uh, 5x5 five five grid, which I've list, listed uh, four different colors, my cad red medium, Indian yellow hue, cobalt blue, and quinacridone magenta. This is uh, actually a really nice uh, set of primaries if you want a sort of a decent range of uh, mixing all the way across the board. Although a, uh, if you want a more reasonable yellow from that, a cad yellow medium uh, is better for a wider range of colors. The Indian yellow hue, as uh, we'll find out, doesn't have the same range of mixing as a, uh, a cadmium or, an, say, an Isloride yellow. 
So color maps are really good for building sort of your own set of references. Color maps, color wheels, color charts, uh, value scales, all of them are really, really great. And if you have a home studio or even just a small space on the corner of a room, hanging hanging those up or just having them for a quick uh, reference, maybe like between a sketchbook or something that you can pull out, ridiculously useful to have, especially if you really want to start learning color mixing and color theory a lot more uh, in depth. So, for this, it's, again, just to stick with four colors, because we don't have all day, uh, when I do a big color map of my, of my acrylic colors, it usually takes the better part of a couple of hours, because I've got a lot of colors, and I really sit there and try and format them out to make things look really, really neat. Uh, but, that's not necessarily the case. You don't have to be that meticulous with it. Um, but you'll find throughout the course of this that I kind of am. Actually, you know what? I want to get a second set of these blobs of color on my palette. Because I'm going to be mixing and intermixing and double mixing over, so it's going to be good to have some extra color. Okay, cobalt blue. And it may seem that you're like you're wasting paint doing something like this, but it, what you'll find is that in having a color map as reference, you'll actually find that uh, it'll save you paint in the long run. I mean, yeah, you're using the paint in the first place to uh, you know make a lot of the co colors and, and to make the, the color map. But after you have this, you won't be sitting there like this, this more of this color, less of this color. You'll already know that by having the color map. So obviously, since we have uh, two uh, of each color on the, uh, every side, or, or one of each color on every side, you're going to have an overlap where they're the same uh, on that diagonal going all the way down. So we're just going to go ahead and start with that. Um, so that way we'll have those out of the way. They'll give you an idea. So pure one-to-one -one obviously won't be uh, much to look at. <laughs> But again, making a color map does a lot for you. And this is just a, a simple piece of watercolor paper, same stuff I was using uh, for those uh, watercolor ink demos earlier. Yeah, you could you could sit there and just you know go nuts making sure it's right up to the line, but I'm gonna just kind of get close for it, so I'm not spending all day doing this. Oddly enough, I do find a lot of enjoyment in, in making color maps, so that's why I decided to include it in uh, today's little workshop. Okay, the Indian yellow hue. Uh, another part of doing the uh, color map is that it teaches you a lot about the colors you're, you're, you have and that you, you're using. Uh, specifically with a high-quality professional paint, uh, like the Goldens that I'm using here today, as well as uh, the Cobalt Blue, which is a Utrecht. Um, you'll find that uh, a lot of colors have different uh, uh, tint strengths and different opacities. Uh, that's really important to note as you're working because, for example, the quinacridone magenta, which we'll get to uh, on that sort of last rung, has a very high tint strength and it's also very transparent. So that's going to change how it mixes with other colors. I'm rinsing the paint off on my brush in between. I don't want to change any of those colors that from pure to not pure. <laughs> and for you uh, pigment nerds, I've actually included the pigment information uh, up along with the color. In case you can't see that, the cadmium red, uh, it's cad red medium, a PR108 pigment. The Indian Yellow Hue is a mixture of PY73, PY150, and PR206. Uh, the Cobalt Blue is a pure PB28, and the Quinacridone Magenta is a pure PR122. And pure pigment paints are going to be generally cleaner mixing colors. Although that is not to say that hue colors are in some way inferior, they are just a little bit different. Oh, 
All right, last one is that Quinn Magenta. It's for probably my favorite color of paint of all time. Mostly due to its intense color and great versatility, which we will see as we go. Okay, so since that Quinn Magenta is already on my brush, I'm going to go ahead and just mix some blue into that. And when I'm doing a color map, I'm trying to get not necessarily volume-wise, one-to-one, but I'm looking for uh, sort of one-to-one -one pigment and sort of how that kind of shifts from one end to the other. Of course, now, since we're, these are these were all one, there's going to be two, so it's one, two, and then three, four, whatever. So same color on multiple squares here. Now, this cobalt blue and the Quinn Magenta give us a really nice, vibrant purple that I just adore. <laughs> And again, not necessarily volume one-to-one -one on the color, but looking for just roughly what 50% looks like in terms of our color mix. Um, so Quinn Cobalt, Quinn Cobalt here. Now one thing I end up usually doing all this little extra white space, I'll come in when this is dry with a Sharpie and just grid the rest of them out so it takes away those uh, imperfections. Okay. Now I've got to divide that Quid Magenta out of my palette to accommodate for the next two mixes. Uh, in this case, we're going for the Indian Yellow. As I mentioned before, the Quid Magenta has a much higher tint strength, so it's going to, have to be a lot more potent. In this case, volume one-to-one -one is not going to be the same. We're going to be using a little bit more of the Indian Yellow compared to the uh, Quid Magenta on that. But you find that it gives us a really nice sort of vibrant reddish-orange. Right. And last one for the quinacridone magenta, I'm really better at saying that, is the cad red medium. Which is just going to basically like really intensify the redness of the red by mixing with that. This gives us almost like a nice kind of a rose color. All right. Again, if you're just joining in, welcome to the uh, live workshop demo at Red Fishbowl Studios. Going over some uh, simple, but not necessarily common uh, painting techniques and uh, tips from my regular set and things I use in my studio on a regular basis, but sharing them with you guys as always. All right, what do we got next? Cobalt and Indian Yellow. Probably gonna get a little bit more of that Indian Yellow hanging out on my palette pretty soon, especially when we get to the red. I'm actually gonna go ahead and grab it now. Re really, really, really great color. Mostly for its uh, glazes underneath. Like this is just the mass tone. If I actually end up pulling some of that out, you can see this gold in the glaze, which looks really nice. All 
Alrighty. Cobalt and Indian Yellow. Again, our Indian Yellow is kind of low tinting. So I'm going to be mixing a little bit more of the yellow than the blue. And one thing with uh, any kind of color mixing is you'll find that some colors are more compatible for mixes uh, than others. So we're not getting a pure green by just mixing a yellow and a blue. Uh, you have to kind of account for some extra uh, extra color bias in that. And if you find more about color bias uh, on the YouTube channel here, but that's specifically, uh, I would say, more of a topic for another video. So rather than just sort of a green, we're getting, because of a lot of the warmer yellows as well as that red in the Indian yellow, and the fact that our blue is also a warm blue, rather than a cool blue, what we're getting out of this is a much, uh, rather than greener, we're getting something a little bit more brown out of that, rather than getting the, uh, what you might expect, more of it being a pure greenish color. So you get something a little browner than you might expect otherwise. So again, got to think about color biases. Does it lean warmer? Does it lean cooler? If the, they both lean in the same direction, uh, your color mix won't be quite as profound and uh, high chroma as you probably are expecting it to be. Like so. All right, so we have the then we have the Indian yellow and the cadmium red. In this case, our red and it's going to be a little more potent than the yellow, and thus we'll need a little less. This is going to be fairly similar to what we got out of the red in the Quin magenta, but leaning, of course, a little bit more. Uh, towards the yellow side rather than uh, the more violet side because, you know, it's a yellow. Duh. Now when I'm doing a real big color map, I tend to lose track of like, was it my here, is it there, whatever. But doing a small one like this is relatively easy. It's a lot uh, easier to keep track of what squares you're on. All right, and of course we have our red and our blue. But again, you're probably gonna see not necessarily the color mix you're expecting to get. In this particular case, we're looking at, uh, again here, cobalt blue and uh, cad red. Both are warm biased colors. Uh, red obviously being as warm biased as you can get because it's a warm color. But uh, the blue, when we add that in, you're not going to see as pure of a purple that you might be expecting like what we got out of the quinacridone and magenta. You're going to be getting something a little bit more neutral. Essentially just kind of making like a deep red. And in this case, again, having the both of them being warm biased colors, just kicks that uh, red back in value rather than pushing that higher uh, chroma change. Like so. And there you have a fairly simple acrylic color map made with four different and distinct colors. I would say the blue obviously is the biggest offset in this, uh, but again if you're doing this with a lot more colors a lot uh, and a lot, uh, I would say, more, more different colors, a lot of these are very warm biased colors. If you have more of a cool yellow in that, you're going to see a bigger change and bigger leaps in between them. 
one thing you'll see me do, uh, especially if you watch the, uh, the channel here on YouTube, because something you'll see in the background a lot, are individual color maps. So if I get a new color, for example, when I got the Indian yellow hue, rather than doing a big map like this, I just did a little one where I did little dabs of the color mixed with every other color I had on a smaller scale. And that gives me a good understanding of what the color can do with the colors I already have. And going forward from there, it's really easy to see that and go, oh, okay, so that's what that does, and that's what that does. And you can reference back to it very, very easily, and it just uh, helps in general to get you uh, going, especially if you're either new to more complex color mixes or just looking to expand what you do in terms of color theory. Now, in the time that I've been doing that, this has dried, so we can get back to working on this. Now, this is actually pretty flat. I'm kind of surprised, so I'm not going to worry about reflattening this one. Uh, but we are going to go ahead and play with the ink one more time. And with this, we are going to... Uh, just <laughs> seeing what else I need to demo before the end of the day. Uh, with this one, do something a little bit differently. So one thing I love doing with the ink spray, and rather than just making these... Uh, big ridiculous uh, weed shapes from uh, our little one from earlier and you know this is fun it's more abstract but it's a little bit also kind of limiting and uh, while there is some intention behind this as I mentioned earlier there's also a little bit less intention behind this so when you actually use that technique to do something a little bit I don't know different <laughs> a little more reasonably uh, I don't know reasonably I don't know what's <laughs> the word I'm looking for is here, put together, com composed, uh, something of that nature, uh, you can start doing things that maybe start to change the way people look at uh, maybe the same similar work over and over again. So I'm actually going to start this just with a regular, um, <coughs> what do I call this, a uniball, it's a uh, Micron Graphic 1, and I'm going to draw a tree on here. Just fairly simple here. I'm not gonna go nuts, but want to have it with a whole lot of little extra branches coming out and over. Big one here. So this is fairly si simple, kind of what I would maybe do in my sketchbook for a, a little project. Fatten up the trunk of this a bit. Maybe get some crossing branches here and there. So that's at least a little bit more interesting. Uh, where else do I want to go with that one? Maybe here. Got a little bit of moisture still in the uh, my watercolor base, but that's quite all right. There's a lot we can do with this in varying capacities. All right, so from here, I'm gonna build a little bit of a base to it, some roots, something like that. And this is where we can have some fun with that ink spray. Because now, rather than sitting and playing like, oh, I'll just draw the roots in this and maybe make them some stones, no, no, no. We can go a little further with this and let the ink spray be our root system. So, little blob of ink as before. I'm actually going to keep this relatively centralized and just kind of put most of that whole dropper right there. And now, get my other piece out of the way so I don't ruin it. <laughs> and then, again, can of compressed air, nozzle on there, get a nice spray with it. Make sure you're well within the uh, area where you can do so. You're not going to splatter anything that you shouldn't. And then, simply, I need a little bit more on this side here. Kind of got a little too far to that edge. And 
you know, you can go a little further, a little less far, you know, whatever you happen to feel the need to do. I'm going to push this out a little bit more. Being a, trying to be selective, but not go overboard, because again, this is a thinner sheet of watercolor paper. I can very easily just go nuts with this and make a mess. But something like that, with a little extra intention, a little extra finessing, lets you play just a little bit more with that te technique to make it just, you know, take it a little that little step further. This is what I mean by adding a little extra attention and uh, intention as well uh, to make something that, while unique and different, uh, also has some, some <laughs> pun, no pun intended, rooted in a level of accuracy to that. Throw a couple of drips in there. And just like that, we got ourselves a something of a tree. So I'm not really fond of that, and that was probably a mistake. But it's ink, and I can't really change that now. So let's put use that ink that's already on there to put leaves on that tree then. Just dab with it. Or even uh, get an occasional leaves since it's a pretty thin ink. Since well, it actually works really well because we're just getting the Still getting the uh, the underlying shape. We sort of have a, just like a gray ink on top of that, which is working a lot better than I thought it would. You never know. Sometimes you surprise yourself with stuff like this. I like that. That'll work. Nice, simple. Again, same technique. Two different pieces, two different uh, approaches to it. And again, I'm a landscape person, so it's going to go right into... Jeez. Headset still going everywhere. It's going to go right into those and, and create just those in interesting techniques for, uh, in this case, for a landscape. But again, you can do this in portraiture. You can do this in just strictly abstract stuff, and it looks great either way. Uh, but I really love using it for landscape stuff because it's really just such a different and unique way to approach that. And again, simple technique, picked it up from another artist, but uh, more unusual, not something you probably think of every day. All right. So one last technique before we call it a day. And this is something that uh, I've demoed a couple of times on the channel, and it's not something I use a ton anymore uh, because I've changed my approach to... Uh, using the, the particular medium. Now, this particular technique uh, requires a certain medium in particular, and that is some Golden's light molding paste. Now, what makes the light molding paste uh, so unique and so different is that it's a lightweight uh, material that you can build super stiff textures and peaks with. Now, I pre had to prep this in advance, uh, otherwise I would have shown you the, uh, the demo with it uh, wet, but I can't because otherwise we'd have to sit here for four or five hours and wait for it to dry. So super uh, stiff uh, textural work to allow you to create actual texture on your acrylic painting. Now, why would you want to create actual texture on your painting? Well, uh, a lot of different reasons, mostly personal preferences, but you can do certain special effects with them. And one of the ones that I uh, used to do more, not so much anymore, but still really uh, cool and really effective to create a piece that's more dynamic, especially when you see it in person, is to do what I've come to call paint sculpting. Uh, so essentially you're creating thick impasto brushwork and then dry brushing on top of that. So what I've already done is I kind of, similar thing to one of these other pieces that I've, I don't even think I brought it with me. So I have an, a basic ac acrylic sky as, as the background. Um, did some really simple little shapes back there, but our focus here is just to look at this foreground. So I applied this with a knife and then came back in with a brush and just kind of evened that out creating sort of what I would do in my sketchbook to create sort of simple hatching and cross hatching in certain directions. Now, when you're doing this, it's really important to build that texture up and think about those shapes first. If you don't do it that way, what you'll find is like, oh, well, I wanted that 
if only, if only that 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 mound was going this way or that way, because then at that point you're like, well, you can't change it; it's dry. And this stuff tends to take a little bit longer to dry because acrylics, while well, taking short time to dry in general, uh, still, if you're talking about that much paint and that thick layer of paint, it's going to take some time. This I did this morning around eight o'clock. Uh, it was dry, I think, by like one, maybe uh, maybe twelve thirty, something like that. Uh, and actually, it is still a, probably a little bit wet underneath, but it's dry enough to do what I uh, want to do with it today. So, from here, I'm going to grab a couple of different colors here. Actually, most of the ones I need are on my palette already. Uh, but I'm grabbing some titanium buff, which is a slightly modified version of the titanium white pigment. It's a little bit uh, more muted, a little extra not extra, uh, it's a little browner of a color, makes for a uh, more reasonable highlight color on top of things. Uh, now when I did this, uh, I had, had the full intention of kind of keeping it simple. Uh, it's really easy to go overboard with this stuff, especially if you're uh, new to using it. Like, we'll just put texture everywhere. I did that, doesn't look that great, trust me. Uh, but what you can do with this is, now that this is dry, it's a really easy way to make textured rocks without needing to texture them and, and needing to really think about the detail of your brushwork. You can take all the guesswork out of it. Again, this is actual texture on the canvas. Comes up, I don't know, maybe an extra couple of millimeters uh, to create. An, like if you were, if you were to rub your hand across it, which in most galleries would be uh, generally frowned upon. Uh, for something like this, it's, I'm often like, yeah, go ahead and feel it. It's like actually there. Um, of course, the oils in your hands and a lot of people's hands would degradate uh, the painting over time, but that is a topic, I believe, for another day. So with any kind of dry brushing, you want to make sure your brush is dry, or at least dry enough, uh, that you're not picking up on too much extra, uh, extra water. And I'm actually going to mix a little bit of a brown here. I'm going to grab my red. Got some of this green still on there. Some of that Indian yellow to kind of max, match our sky a little bit. And we'll use that to start. Now, I wanna, since I, I, when I mix with this stuff, I usually kind of build up a dark color first and then do layers of light on top of that. So my light source kind of front and back a little bit. Or, yeah, center and back, excuse me, not front and back. And I'm just going to drag some of this as a mid-tone color on top first which you guys probably won't see a whole heck of a lot, uh, just because it's the, the nature of the product and the fact that I uh, started dark and I'm starting kind of dark as well here, but I want to be sure that that color is there before we do any over, over layers at this point. All right, so I'm going to go straight into my uh, Titan buff, mix it with some of that a little bit of the brown that's left. Do I have any of that cad yellow that's still dry? No, or still wet rather. No, it's dried out. So I actually want to grab just a hint of that on my finger. Stick that on my palette. Again, I apologize for the shaking is the camera. Not something I can do deal with today because not in my regular studio space. A little bit of that yellow. There it is. That Indian yellow. There we go. That's a lot closer to what I'm looking, thinking about. Now, just paint, no no dipping in the water, just using a little bit of paint off of the brush. And all I'm doing is keeping the brush almost flat with the um, uh, the canvas here. And I'm just going to be dragging that a, a little bit. Not, not tip of the brush here. Uh, so really side of the brush. And then just... And as we're dragging... We're just picking up on all of those little textures that we created, or that I created earlier this morning. And it creates this nice sort of illusion of detail without really having to try too hard. That's going to show up a little bit better, and then I'm just going to go pretty much dirty brush here, still not rinsing. I'm just going to go straight into that Titan buff, 
for that final layer so that really pops out for you guys and just dragging that across. And it just picks up on all the sort of the high spots. Almost went into the black there, that would have been bad. Like so. Super fast, simple, easy way to do that. Now from here, I'm actually going to grab some of our, that carbon black that was left, mix it with some of that cobalt blue that was left, and come in for some shadows. Same deal, it's going to drag across those high points, pick up on the little bit of detail, and allow you to create the illusion of complex brushwork without actually doing any of it. <laughs> like so. So that was actually the last thing on my uh, sort of reel of demos for today. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and take, take a quick little uh, review here of everything we took care of and everything we looked at today. First of that, first of all, is the acrylic and rubbing alcohol technique. Uh, again, this is something that uh, it's been around for a while, but the way I've kind of come to implement it has uh, changed a little bit over the past few years. Uh, the first demo here, simply going through with a uh, anywhere from a soft body to a more liquid paint, brushing that on top, dripping some uh, rubbing alcohol on top, do a resist technique, and uh, create all kind of different unusual shapes. In this case, I'm playing with the idea of these being more like plant animal cells hanging out in a petri dish or something like that. Should, should be really fun once I get this back into the studio and uh, work on refining the detail of that one. Uh, that is a, sort of an additive way of using that, but there's also a subtractive way of using that. Uh, it's something I've been playing with uh, off and on over the past year, uh, doing an oil paint base, doing a acrylic clear coat on top of that, and on top of that, using a thick acrylic paint, usually a dark color, at least to start out, and that then uh, you can remove that when it's dry, or even sort of tacky dry, to uh, blend with that, bring in the rubbing alcohol as a medium, rather than water, in order to recreate some extra uh, techniques with that way, doing using it kind of like scratch board, you know, whatever you happen to uh, feel like doing at the time. Uh, another fun thing you can do, with that's a little less common, is to use ink or a thin black acrylic or whatever color you happen to be using, as long as it's liquidy enough, uh, putting that down onto a piece of paper, sometimes a really smooth canvas or a piece of wood, blasting that with a can of compressed air in order to create really interesting branchy techniques and shapes. Uh, now I've used, again, in this particular instance, doing it as a uh, as a landscape technique, but this can very, very easily be applied to portraits and can really do some uh, unique things with it. Uh, I've never really seen it done with portraits, but I'd love to see what you can guys could come up with uh, using that in that way. Outside of those, uh, it's also really important, especially if you're really playing with color theory and want to take your work further, maybe save some paint in the long run, is to make yourself a color map. I've talked about color maps on this channel before, but it's really, really great to uh, get around to utilizing uh, a color map, especially if you can hang it up somewhere in your studio uh, to give yourself a better understanding of what your colors can to do, what your colors can do, and how uh, you can better use them and utilize them in your own work. And finally, uh, if you happen to find yourself in the art store and you pick yourself up some uh, light molding paste from Golden, or really any high-density uh, texture medium, high-solid gels, uh, heavy gel mats, stuff like that, well, I say heavy gel mat, you can have heavy gel gloss, a, a heavy gel. Uh, regular molding paste works too, but not necessarily quite as well. Mixing that with a dark color, or whatever you happen to uh, want to go with, building up some underlying texture, letting that dry completely, and then dry brushing on top of that to give yourself the illusion of detail without necessarily going out of your way to paint every single little line. So, uh, that said, I'm going to go ahead and uh, get stuff cleaned up. Uh, once I do, uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, see what I can do to kind of 
wander around the gallery a little bit. It's kind of quiet today. I don't know if we're actually open to the public or not, but it uh, should be really fun to show you guys some of the work from the other artists uh, here at Red Fishbowl Studios. So st sit tight. I'm going to go ahead and clean up a little bit, and uh, I will be back.
Okay, so that's about it for uh, general things, clean up. I'm going to see if I can actually manage to walk you guys around the room with the webcam here. Because I don't think I've ever done a live thing, at least outside of today, from here at Red Fish Wolf. So I want to give you guys a little tour here, uh, if at all possible. And to kind of put the webcam down on the laptop and walk you guys around like that. Uh, oh, right, I gotta change the things. We're gonna be upside down now. <laughs> Hang on. Uh, horizontal. And vertical. There we are. <laughs> Took me a minute. So, uh, I'm currently... Eh, hanging out in sort of the, one of these sort of side uh, gallery spaces. I actually wanna move this over to here so I can see, there we go. I'm sort of in one of the side gallery spaces, um, set up a small table in order to actually work. Uh, there's a community work room behind me, but I was kind of told I probably shouldn't be there and other just disturbing people uh, in varying directions. Uh, I'm gonna actually have to, Pull the cord up here and there and that and unplug this and see how long the battery decides to last on my laptop before things decide to get to kind of drop. So lift this up, wander around the room, see what I can do with this. So I've got art from all sorts. Actually, hold on a second. I'm zoomed in too. <laughs> Almost forgot about that. Hang on. Okay. Sorry, forgot. I had all kind of. Oh, wow, I got ink all over my screen. That's awesome. Uh, 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 camera. Zoom. There we go. That's better. And I'll flip on autofocus. Because I'm sure we're going to be a little bit more variable. Okay. So, yeah, this is where I've been today uh, here on my uh, little makeshift setup. So you can tell, yes, I was not actually at home at Center Blocks View as I've been here at Red Fishbowl Studios in this little side space. So there's uh, dozens of artists that show here at, uh, at Red Fishbowl and uh, lots of different styles, lots of different um, mediums in general. And hey, look, it's us. Um, so yeah, this is just a little side spot. Uh, everything from uh, pop art to political art to uh, nerd-inspired stuff. There's a Majora's Mask thing that's been here for a little while. Um, this little side section, we're going to come out here. And now we're into sort of the main gallery-ish area. That's fine. Sorry, didn't think my mic was down. Uh, would have been talking to nobody for a while here. All right, so, yeah, we've got uh, hats, ceramics, all kind of things here. Uh, there's a triptych I did over here uh, late last year. This was up on those one, two, three, <laughs> up like that. Um, yeah, all kind of, all kind of stuff here. There was a big uh, masquerade party here last uh, last night for Halloween, so all kind of things are there. This is some stuff from uh, Camp Schmidt, really cool artist. He was actually here until I don't know if he's still here or not. Might be hiding. Also, not all the lights are on in here, so that changes things a little bit. 90s kids, huh? Eh? <laughs> yeah, so a whole big bunch of stuff uh, here at Redfish Full Studios. Again, variety of artists, mediums, styles. Uh, this is kind of a dark corner. I don't even know where the lights are for in here. Um, yeah, and this is the space that I kind of wanted to be because the table is bigger and higher, and this is sort of the community workspace. Um, a lot of in progress stuff, paint everywhere. If I'm trying to get out of the studio and clear my head a little bit to find some new inspiration, this is usually the room I come to. Also, because I have a piece that I did in November right here. Uh, that's a nice big wood one. Uh, I don't even know what the size on this was. It was something like uh, three and a half by like seven feet, I think, something like that. 
Uh, there are artists that do work with cl uh, clothing designs and uh, painting on those for extra repurpose. Oh, there's another one of mine. Ding! Hiding in the corner. Uh, yeah. So I have a few pieces uh, floating around in sort of in the middle. I go back here towards the towards the front. Starting to hurt my hand. I can hurry this up a little bit here. Uh, corner of a lot of smaller stuff. A lot of the, sort of the rotating artists uh, aren't necessarily members of the gallery. On, on t a lot of t time, their stuff's kind of up towards the center here and front. Little sculptural things. Uh, this side, all kind of cool stuff. There's my collaborative piece I did with uh, with Rareth. It's too dark to see with the camera right now, but it's here. Um, this artist is pretty cool. Uh, this one and uh, this one in the end, it's a little darker uh, because of the light's not on. Uh, artist by the name of Robert Walker. This one caught my attention because I was like, did I make this? <laughs> kind of has uh, a lot of similar style style elements to the stuff that I do. So, uh, yeah, Robert Walker. I've, i got to meet that guy. I don't know if I've been around. Sort of a front desk and things. A lot of different stuff. The COVID Pokemon virus. That's uh, that's John Muldoon. He's got he does all this geometric stuff. Uh, he's one of our residents. And in this sort of corner, up by the window, is sort of my corner, because the large, large variety of my own work is hanging out up here. And I was actually surprised. Uh, a couple of pieces I just put in here are uh, by the river they stand, all the way up top. Um, Wellspring of Eternity is uh, the middle one. And uh, actually, the most recent painting across this video, I think it was, uh, Edge of the Forbidden Sea. And those two, uh, the uh, Wellspring and, and Forbidden Sea, sold yesterday. They've been in the studio for, I think, less than a week and uh, already sold them. There's another one. Ding. Another one of mine there. Another one of mine there. I got a lot of, I got a lot of stuff down here. So this is sort of my uh, artistic home away from home uh, when I'm looking to do another project or uh, get my head out of the air, come down and get some new inspiration. Uh, this is where I end up going. This is, uh, so yeah, a little mini tour of Red Fishbowl Studios. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's my little thing. When I, talk, when I talk about doing projects at the gallery or coming down to the gallery for projects, this is where I am and this is what I'm doing. Uh, so really fun hanging with you guys here today. Uh, again, I really wanted to do this actually earlier in the year. I wanted to have a uh, in-person demo here at the gallery, but I couldn't do that, which sucked. Uh, but I happened to line up with my vacation that had a free Sunday here, and I was like, you know what? Let's do a virtual one. So if you've been watching uh, from my regular YouTube channel, <sighs> talking with this mask on really sucks. Um, <laughs> Uh, watching uh, from my uh, regular YouTube uh, subscribers, uh, thanks guys for watching. If you've been a fan of Red Fishbowl or me online through other media, specifically through the gallery, uh, thanks guys for watching this as well. Um, this is something I love doing. If you want to check out more of my work in progress and other things I do on the side, uh, stick around here to this in the Block Studios channel here on YouTube. Um, that's pretty much it for me. Um, Keep on creating, keep on loving art, support local artists if you're in your area, whether that be here at Red Fishbowl Studios or wherever you happen to live in the world. And this has been from Cinemalock Studios reminding you to keep on creating, and I will see you guys next time. End. <laughs>